Hello, everybody! Hello! We made it, we made it. It was so much work getting everybody together tonight. Hey, Rotorax. How you doing? Okay, so welcome to our inaugural episode of Star Citizen StarCast podcast. Uh, it's going to be myself this week, Perfect, and Pancakes. I'll let them introduce themselves in just a second. It might rotate out, but these are all members of the Star Citizen community out there. All right, so one little bit of note I want to mention that uh, when we do have this available, it will be available on all of our YouTube channels independently. You can watch it on any of our channels. I will also be putting this out as an audio-only podcast so people can listen to it on their iPad, iPod, whatever, or their phones. So we'll get into that. All right, so introduce yourself, Mr. Perfect. Uh, so, I'm perfect, sort of, not really. I am, uh, so I'm the perfect nerd, it's short and perfect, uh, it's the German spelling. Um, but, uh, I'm also known as Mibiro on the Star Citizen base forums. Uh, you guys might know me from there. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I am a huge fan of Star Citizen, I'm a huge fan of Chris Harvard's work in general, um, and, uh, I've always been really into flight sims, uh, the games I played the most when I was young because for the most part that's all uh, my brothers bought. <laughs> so uh, basically I had to play whatever they wanted to get because uh, they were the ones with the money. Uh, so we always played stuff like X-Wing and X-Wing vs. TIE Fighter and uh, Free Space 2 and Wing Commander and Freelancer and stuff like that. So I've always been really into to flight sims, and uh, as soon as I heard that Chris Roberts was doing something, um, I got really excited because uh, space sims had been dead for a ridiculously long time. Uh, so I am a proud holder of a golden ticket, um, which I didn't use because <laughs> I couldn't get to Austin or wherever they had that thing. Uh, but yeah, so that's about it, I guess. All right. That's good. All right, Mr. Pancakes, tell us about yourself. Okay, so I'm Pancakes. I believe in that on both the Star Citizen forums and Star Citizen base. I've been following Star Citizen for like six months by now, so I'm uh, pretty excited to see how it goes. Um, this would have to be probably my first base sim I've ever played, which is pretty great. So... <laughs> I'm just uh, really excited about seeing how Chris Roberts uses just, you know, how he wants to just use PCs and really wants to make a really strong game. So I'm excited to see how that goes. Absolutely. All right. A little bit about me. I'm Geek Domo. Uh, you all are watching it on my Twitch channel here, but I do a series for Star Citizen uh, called Ramp Up, and I do Ramp Up for other games too. So. Uh, I decided that we should probably get some community members together. We could do a show similar to what we do for Into the Portal. Uh, my Sims experience goes way back. I, I started flying uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator back in the original IBM PC, <laughs> which was around like 1982. It was CGA, and you flew it with your keyboard because there were no such thing as joysticks in those days. And um, it would take you like four or five hours to fly from Chicago to New York and it was uh, you're flying like a Cessna there was nothing that special with it and I moved into uh, different other flight sims of course I went into the Navy uh, at the time uh, Wing Commander 3 had just come out and so I took it with me when I wanted deployment and uh, played that game about 400 times like I just kept playing it over and over and over again going through all of the different missions as many different times as I could I loved Mark Hamill in that game uh, then I played Wing Commander 4 of course Privateer, love that game. I think I took that with me too uh, on one of the deployments, so I played a lot of Privateer. So yeah, I uh, have a long history of games with Chris Roberts. I love a lot of his work, but I did not get turned on to this game until Mr. Pancakes and his brother turned me on to it. So they kept telling me, you got to look at this game, and this was like around, um, what, March or April, I think they first started beating me up about it. And I looked into it a little bit. I thought, okay, it's not a neat premise. Uh, but I didn't jump in as early, nearly as early as, as either Pancakes or Perfect. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about my background with this game. Um, Perfect, tell me a little bit about this golden ticket. What is this? So uh, originally, um, before Chris Roberts announced Star Citizen Squadron 42, um, 
he basically he made a website with a countdown timer on it. Uh, and uh, if you went to this website and you signed up and you put your information and your email in there, um, you got this golden ticket, which was an invitation for, I think, uh, October 10th? It was, well, no, it was, it was something like that. It was 10, 10, 10. It said on the golden ticket. And um, basically, uh, it was really intriguing. It was kind of like, you know, uh, there was a lot of hype uh, on the website, but it wasn't, he wasn't really telling at that point what he was coming out with. Um, and so uh, people sort of sat on these golden tickets for a little while. Uh, and then uh, he did a live stream uh, where he basically came out and said, you know, this is what we're trying to do, um, and we're doing our own crowdfunding campaign. Uh, at that time, he didn't actually even have, he didn't have a Kickstarter at all. Uh, so yeah, that was sort of, it, the golden tickets were sort of like the basis for uh, the hype train, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yep, they're pretty cool. Great so they're, they're very limited release is what you're saying. They only came out around 2010 and if you got the golden ticket uh you got into a special special release i don't think, I don't think it was 2010 i'm pretty sure it was uh it was actually 2012 uh it was october 10th i think at 10 a.m okay <laughs> that was the three tens uh so yeah it was yeah it was pretty awesome uh i gotta say the i was i don't know at that time i was so pumped I, I can't even remember like exactly what I was doing on that day or, or in that general time period because like as soon as as soon as I heard something was going down with you know like the modern iteration of the space sim, uh, everything else just is like my memory just obliterated everything else. Yeah, yeah. That's what that's, that's what I'm like every time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So before we get going here with the actual the discussion. Uh, how this show runs is I'm gonna pop up on the screen a topic. We're just gonna sit around and talk around, uh, talk about the topic, talk what we can about it. You know, we'll, we can stray off it a little bit here and there. Um, but for those who are viewing right now, we have like 20, I think, but well, we had 20. Uh, for people that are here, if you want, uh, we're going to be answering questions. So we're gonna do a Q and A at the end of the show. So all you have to do is write question in brackets. Just say question, the word question with in brackets or parentheses whatever and then that'll let us know that's a question for later and we'll, we'll take it up and we'll answer those as we get to the end of the show so that's pretty much how we do it okay so let's turn on our first topic no that's not our first topic uh, I guess I guess we'll start with future stretch goals so um, how they do it is uh, as they're working their way up, this is a completely crowdfunded game. So uh, people are paying money in to help support the game. It's not being developed through, uh, sorry, trend, Trendane, yes, that's exactly how you do it. Um, but it's not being developed through a normal procedure like you would go out and ask a producer to help produce your game, which they would put in millions of dollars and then have a lot of say in it. Basically, we are, as the public, supporting Star Citizen. And through our donations, we are awarded little prizes. Basically, it's like ships or, or hangers or things like that, little things uh, for donating. So as we get going, uh, they have stretch goals, meaning that uh, later on, every time he make it, we make another million dollars for the game, that that money then is used for development. But he, he, they release something else about the game. So currently, can you go over some of the stretch goals that they've already had? Either one of you guys can talk about it. I'll, just, I'll select you as you talk. Can you go ahead? Sure. Uh, okay, actually, let's just pull it up. Um, okay. Let's see, funding milestones. Okay, so... So I think uh, in, in terms of like the way they did it, if we just... Uh, uh, it's actually kind of fascinating because... Uh, they first, like I said, they first started out with only uh, the uh, the crowdfunding campaign on their website, uh, and eventually they branched into a Kickstarter. But I think the Kickstarter was mostly for 
um, uh, hype and like just generating interest in, in the project. And I think it really served it well, even though it only generated maybe you know seven eight hundred thousand dollars or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess we could start with the first stretch goal was that which was at two million, um, and that was just regular community updates. I mean, it wasn't anything. Um, anything huge. It was just the community updates. Citizens with appropriate packages will get to play in the multiplayer uh, dogfighting module. So this was the announcement of the alpha mm -hmm. um, for people who had paid uh, $250 or more in total or, of ships or were uh, had bought the Rear Admiral uh, package. And uh, then citizens with appropriate packages will receive access to the 30 mission squadron 42 campaign upon release. So uh, that was for anybody who had bought a package that included Squadron 42, which uh, I think was was most packages. Uh, so then, uh, so this was this at this point, this was the only uh, these were the only few tiers that actually weren't separated by a million dollars. Uh, up until you get to, um, I think nine or six million, uh, everything was in increments of about either two hundred fifty or five hundred thousand dollars. Um, and after that, it was in the millions of inc the increments were in the millions. Okay. So at 2.5 million, you had the uh, the Anvil Gladiator uh, as an additional flyable ship, um, which is funny because even though it was the first like extra ship that was announced, it's not even it's not even out yet. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, don't, don't even have concept art yet. <laughs> yeah, they have nothing. It's just like well, okay. <laughs> I think most people have kind of forgotten about it actually. Um, so three million increased community updates at the RSA website, uh, thirty-five missions in Squadron Forty Two, so expanded to Squadron Forty Two, uh, and citizens with appropriate packages will receive access to the Star Citizen universe with forty star si si systems. So basically, uh, I think there was originally uh, thirty star systems mm -hmm. in total, and then they added an extra ten at the three million mark, and. Uh, that's so these first few tiers uh, they either add uh, the tier itself is entirely a ship um, or uh, increased community updates and then uh, increasing numbers of star systems uh, and that keeps going for a while actually and then after at 3.25 million uh, they add the starfare which is another ship uh, which uh, it came out much later than like the Connie or something some other that some other ships of that variety mm -hmm. And you have uh, 3.5 million, you have the cockpit decorations, uh, which I thought was interesting uh, that they actually had to announce that as part of a, a tier, because they announced that at the same time as shipboarding, which, uh, oops. so that's, <laughs> I thought that it was weird that it, it's listed above shipboarding <laughs> as... As, as like the premier <laughs> part of this stretch goal is you can have fuzzy dice in your cockpit. Before you, you know, go on so to so all the rest of them, ones. before you go on all the rest of them, I do have to, I, w I do want to ask, do you think some of these stretch goals are either made up on the fly or are they, you think they're thought out very well? I, I've, I've heard some rumors, people saying, oh, it looks like they're just making it up as they see the next million coming up. I think in the beginning, they weren't exactly sure how far they could take the project. Mm -hmm. So uh, for these first few stretch goals, um, uh, it's, it's pretty apparent, not just in the content of the stretch goals, but also in the difference between them. I mean, they aren't uh, uniformly uh, you know, different in terms of the amount of money to reach each stretch goal. I mean, uh, sometimes it's five hundred thousand. Sometimes it's two hundred fifty thousand. Sometimes it's you know it's a, it's like at s six to nine million. It was there's no there was no stretch goal. Oh okay. Between those two, so uh, I think at that point they weren't they weren't sure exactly how much they could push uh, to get the community to to invest. And obviously now we know that it doesn't matter what they put out. You know, we're gonna do it out, anyway. Yeah, then people are just gonna keep paying anyway. I joined at seventeen million, and that was in August, and now we're popping over twenty-one, right? Are we over? Yeah. Uh, almost a twenty. Yeah. Almost a twenty. So, but the game isn't supposed to come out for another like year and a half. <laughs> yeah. So it just <laughs> uh, it just amazes me the amount of money that we're all pumping into this game, and uh, there's uh, I saw a recent survey that said that uh, the average income for the people that are 
most first off, most of the people are male. Like there's ninety six percent male are funding this game. But the other thing is that <laughs> most really <laughs> probably not. But you would think there'd be maybe some maybe maybe I don't know. But uh, the the average income for these people are around twenty thousand a year, and most people have at least two ships. Like I saw on the thing. So that's a big chunk of change for people that only have you know twenty grand a year to spend. Yeah, seriously, that that seems like it's it's really rough. I mean, it's funny because uh, you know, I mean, I I don't make a ton of money, and I I was I I was hard pressed to get you know two ships. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I mean, people, it, it amazes me how much people must be dedicated to this, and it really it really stands a uh, testament to both Chris Roberts's skill or trust in Chris Roberts's skill as a developer. Uh, and also how desperate people are to really see this uh, uh, this sort of gigantic space MMO sandbox thing come to life, mm-hmm. you know, because there's really been nothing like it ever done before. Matter of fact, that's that was supposed to be our first topic, so let me see if I can figure out how to turn that on, because <laughs> that's actually a good segue to get into that. Let's see. Mm, nope, nope. Yeah, title. No, see, this is the nope. <laughs> Sorry about this, everybody. Can't seem to figure out where the title went. Maybe it's gotta come up. Let's see. No, that's Q and A. Just talk amongst yourselves. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> Difficult. Okay. No, it's. I'll figure it out. Here we go. Ah, here we go. All right, so let's talk about this. This is really important because it kind of frames everything else for the rest of the show. So the history of Star Citizen. Who wants to take this? Well, I just had the last one, so... All right, Bill. Do you want to talk about the history of it? Do you, are you up on how it all started? Um, okay. I, only, I know most of it. Okay. That's shoot. Go ahead. <laughs> all right, so um, Chris Roberts has done... Um, many things in this time, mm-hmm. as I'm sure everyone here is aware. So, he, was it Digital Anvil? Was that his last yeah. game? First yeah. So, mm-hmm. after he had, he, he talks about when a small company gets bought out by a large developer, how pretty soon you see, like, the people who were in charge of that and, like, kind of pioneer just eventually leave. Right. So his whole, like, like vision is to be able to make a development studio and just a game that doesn't have any outside funding except for the people who want to actually play it. Mm-hmm. So, like uh, Perfect was talking about, then he did the website and he did the golden tickets and he did the big reveal. And so you know, things like money started to trickle in and they were getting like, they opened up the office in San Francisco and Austin and then there's like one in Montreal, I think. Mm-hmm. Do you know uh, why he's spread them around? Um, isn't there like, they're all working on different development aspects, I believe. Yeah, that's what I heard too. Yeah, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the uh, Santa Monica office is exclusively for the... Uh, the dogfighting module. Okay. So he spread everybody out so that they, they could work on it independently? Yeah. All right. Anyways. Continue on. Sorry. Interrupt. And so then we, you know, time goes by and there's, there's sort of more community building around this. And the Aurora sale happens. And that was, that was pretty crazy. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, happened, what happened with that? Like, you know, they had made you know, not much over a couple thousand a day, and then in a week, they really, like, you know, raised another two million, you know, it was just oh, insane. Really? Which just happened uh, recently, they just turned on, what was it, the ship they turned on the, the other Caterpillar. day? Caterpillar. Caterpillar, and it, yeah, yeah they just, made uh, almost a million on that one or something. It's yeah. ridiculous, if you think about it, I mean, because uh, since the Aurora sale, uh, the crowdfunding, like, uh, like Pancakes was saying, it hasn't gone down, like, right. it, it, it shot up during the Aurora sale. It was originally like two, three thousand dollars a day, and it it hasn't dropped below like eighty thousand really on average since then a day. Yeah. Uh, 
which is just completely ridiculous. And then they just throw up ship sails, you know, every now and then, and they'll just keep going forever. It's, yeah. it's a phenomenon that's never been done before. Like, this, that's something to point out, is that this whole idea of crowdfunding a game, and a AAA title, now there has been right. other games that have been developed that are good, you know, but they're not AAA. They're not to the level of, you know, like a, a World of Warcraft or, or one of these big uh, titles, because they usually you have to go to a, a developer, get the money and everything like that. So this is an experiment that may never happen again. Who knows? Yeah. All right, so go on, continue on. Sorry, I keep interrupting. So that was a convention, which I can't remember which one it was. It was like, might have been PAX or something, where he does a presentation about, like, just, just how the whole thing works. Mm-hmm. And what it is is that a normal game, because of all, like, you know, how the how many people they have to hire throughout different companies you know every sixty dollar product they sell is only making the original studio like ten bucks right so because of that they have to sell so much more and advertise to a much larger audience which takes more of the profit right and in this one he's talking about because it's just you know like the crowd and then them like they're making forty or fifty off every sixty dollar sale Mm -hmm. so they can you know create a much more a much smaller audience someone who like you know really tailor it to the people who want it so you know that that's why we're all you know so excited because we're seeing these specific things that we just love and we're seeing like you know references from shows like you know your freelancer joe (laughs) pretty obviously serenity it looks just like this it's it's got the little rise as a matter of fact I'll, i'll put it on the screen right now it's got that little rise in the bottom and uh it's just, I mean, who else boards a ship from the front like that? You know, I've never yeah. seen another ship that did that other than the yeah. Serenity. So, yeah, it's, um, there's definitely nods to other shows, but with it, or other products. But that's great, though, because then that kind of right. opens it up to a bigger audience. That's, that's, that's what makes it great. And so, um, after a while, we get to, uh, they release the 300i, and that has pretty much the same effect as the Aurora. That has, like, you know a big $3 million sale in a month or something like that. Mm-hmm. And after that, they do the... Tw- uh, or they, they actually do the second 24-hour live stream that they did. They did the first one earlier on. But they do this 24-hour live stream, and I remember watching that, and that was, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> took a yeah. while, but it, it, was, it was a lot of fun. And so... I mean, you know, really, they all keep this hooked and keeps going until we get to now. Exactly. All right, so that kind of does bring us up to the, up to date with what's going on. And uh, every once in a while, they're releasing new ships. Um, there are some ships. Can you talk a little bit about some of the rarer ships that you can't get right now? Ooh, like the Idris. The big Idris, yeah. yeah. I think that's that's the elephant in the room in, in terms of that specific topic. Everybody wants one. Nobody can get one. <laughs> Uh, it's it. If you wanted to right today, could you buy the biggest package that they have for funding? Could you fund it with the most money, which I think is twenty five hundred dollars, or is it five thousand? Five thousand. Five thousand U.S. dollars. You will get an address. You'll get. You'll get an address. You do get an address. <laughs> that's some. That's some. Either you got a, a lot of disposable income, or you're just so confident that this game is just going to be. Everything you've ever wanted in an no, MMO. No, wait a second. I don't care how confident you are in this game. <laughs> you have to eat food to live. <laughs> yeah. Really eats food though. <laughs> I don't. I'm, I'm doing all right. But the uh, the people that do this, I, I think people that most of the people that bought the high end one ha- actually have very high disposable incomes. You know, they're the type of guy who five thousand dollars is what they usually spend to change the oil in their Ferrari or something. I don't know. So. I think there is a there is a market for people like that out there. Which brings us to our next topic. Let's go to our next one because you saw me pop it up a couple of times. Let's see if I can get it in the right order here. Here we go. Pay to win or pay for advantage. Uh, I just did a video yesterday um, talking about pay to win and, and how it is actually not part of Star Citizen. Some people see all these different ships that you can buy and if you want to dump tons of money into it that you will... Um, be able to purchase a badass ship. So there's different ones. I I purchased the Freelancer 
Uh, Bill, which one do you have, or which ones do you have? I have the Hornet and the 100i. So, so the 300i is sort of a luxury, um, think of it like a Mercedes kind of car, you know, it's kind of a luxury, smaller mm -hmm. but fast, uh, has fairly, pretty decent firepower, and then the Hornet is your uh, attack ship. Um, those two ships are pretty high end a lot better than what you would start off with at first now what about you perfect what do you what do you have for your ship or ships i have the constellation and the uh, 315p which is the ex exploration model version of the uh, 300i it has a jump drive right it does have a jump drive right which is awesome but you know i was i was thinking about this the other day i watched i watched that video and you know it's it's funny because in order to really gain a distinct advantage over somebody else you have to have like a much larger ship because if you just have like a constellation uh and you're dogfighting somebody with a uh who's say out with like a hornet or uh even like an aurora or something they have a pretty distinct maneuverability advantage over you uh especially if you're crewing alone right. uh, and uh so if you really want to get uh an advantage with a larger ship you have to go large. And I mean, I'm talking like an Idris or something like that. And if you have like 5,000 bucks to drop on the game, mm -hmm. you're going to gain an advantage. I mean, at that point, it's not, it's not like it's, uh, it's, uh, you're, I like the, I like the analogy because it is really paying for an advantage. The advantage is entirely temporary. It right. starts out at the beginning of the game if you were somebody who could drop 5,000 bucks on the game, yeah, you're going to have an advantage uh, in terms of just sheer firepower. Um, but in terms of, like, you know, your ability to have fun and, like, you know, create engaging, emergent gameplay, that's not really going to change. Uh, if you have a ship, uh, the universe is, you know, it's your sandbox. Mm -hmm. You can go do whatever you want. Uh, regardless of what kind of ship you have, uh, your gameplay options don't really change, so yeah, it's it's it, it really is pay for advantage uh, in certain situations, uh, and it's definitely it's definitely not pay to win. That's what, that brings up a really good point because as an adv an investor in the game, it's a lot like when you uh, let's see, I'll use a real a reason a more recent one that I can remember. Um, what was it? Oh, Swotor, right? Star Wars: The Old Republic. Yeah game was terrible right whatever but if you bought the beta early enough they or you bought the game early enough you were allowed to join in on a, a two-week head start and that's pretty much all these ships are really giving you because you will be able to play the game earn enough credits to buy one of these ships even the rare one as rare as the idris which will probably be some huge legendary quest line to get the ship of that size and power um, well, I know that, like, even the Idris, you, there's only a limited number of them of the universe. Right, you have to destroy thing. one to get it, or you have to steal yeah. one to get it, right? So you got to get a whole bunch of boarding parties together to try to take out the, the crew inside. We'll get to that one in a second. Okay. But, yeah, so there is only a limited number. But either way, it's still just more of a, uh, and Trend Dane said this in the chat, it's more of pay to be impatient. So you yeah. can right now say, yes, I own the Idris, which is the best ship in the game right now and uh, I can kick your ass which is fun and it's fun to walk around the, the hangar and look at your ship but that's pretty much all you really can do with it when the game finally starts it's going to give you the advantage in that say for me I really wanted to be uh, a merchant or like an explorer so I got the um, freelancer if I was to play the game from day one I would have to start out in like the newbie zone I, I don't really say that this is going to be like this in this game I'm just using an example I would have to start out in the newbie zone and do a bunch of missions running back and forth trying to drop off the gear or sell my stuff and and just kept doing these rotational things to build up enough money to be able to buy my freelancer by me buying it now I'm putting my trust in the game and I'm saying for this I would like to have that little bit of a head start and that's really all you're really getting when it comes to uh, with this for pay. I, I, that's all I can think of as far as pay to win goes. I don't really think of it as normal pay to win is you would go out, buy something that you guys would not be able to get by playing the game. But they said right off the bat that you will always be able to earn every single thing in the game that somebody could buy as a, as a funder. Kind of reminds me of uh, the talk about the World of Warcraft microtransaction. It's like 
you know, really the only thing you can get is a pet or like a cosmetic item mm -hmm. or an XP post. Like that's only really going to help you and isn't it going to affect other people a whole lot. Mm -hmm. So, right. Because I mean, does it, especially for PvP, it doesn't matter how much money you spend, uh, your skill isn't going to change. And, right. you know, it doesn't. It's not gonna. It, your bracket is whatever level you're at. So that's. Uh, I mean, you'll get to the next bracket faster, I guess. But that's not really gonna do anything for you. That's just what Trendane was just kind of saying. Is um, if you were playing, like if I joined, I play started playing this game six months before you did. I'm gonna have an advantage over you. There's nothing you can do that day to catch up to me. So, right. yeah, it's it's kind of just a, more of a head start more than anything else, sure. and just kind of being able to pick the ship you're gonna work towards anyway. But I will say one thing. The guy who owns the Idris, he he's almost kind of like a person who has gone to the end already. He's sort of like jumped over all of the sort of content you want to really work towards. I want to work my way up to an Idris. I want right. to be able to mm -hmm. work in into that at some point because like I'll use a perfect example. I, I play Skyrim and there's a mod I got for Skyrim that allowed me to get 10 million gold pieces in the showed up right. in this chest, I opened the chest and there's 10 million gold. So now I've got 10 million gold, I ran around, bought every single thing I possibly could and I was bored. So I mm -hmm. actually quit right. playing Skyrim because of that one mod. So the same thing is going to maybe happen for the person who owns the Idris. You know, they've got, yeah. the, they go right to the end and now they've got, what are they going to do afterwards? You know? Okay, yeah, it seems like yours could ruin the fun for yourself, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, uh, I think really there's two, there's two good reasons that, that they allow this. The first thing is that uh, they want to populate the universe with uh, just uh, enough, uh, like uh, a good mix, I guess, a good balance mm -hmm. of both smaller ships and larger ships. Um, and I guess, and the second thing is that, you know, once the game launches, you won't be able to drop 5,000 bucks and buy right. an Idris uh, because they won't be necessarily crowdfunding anymore. They'll be moving into their microtransaction store, um, which is a whole different, I mean, once they get there, then we can discuss whether that's pay to win, you know, uh, because that's, I guess that's the proper situation to do and the proper circumstance in which to discuss that, have that discussion. Um, but right now, uh, the game hasn't even launched yet. I mean, you can you buy a nice ship. It sits in your hangar and looks nice. You can go. You can go walk around in it. I mean, it's yep. it's it's a totally different, uh, totally different discussion. I think. Exactly. All right. Um, make sure everybody, for those who might be just joining us, make sure you write in questions in the chat. As you see, it's coming up on the screen here, and then we're gonna answer them in a Q and A at the end here. So. Uh, let's see here. Uh, next one. Close that. Whoop. Jeez. No, not Q&A time. See, I got these all out of order. <laughs> uh, no, no. No history, no. We are, yeah, I guess it is Q&A time. It is already Q&A time. Oh, well, geez, time. we've already been, we've actually been going on almost an hour now, so yeah, that's fine. Oh, seriously? Yeah, yeah. we have. <laughs> Mm -hmm. All right, so Bill, uh, Pancakes, have you been gathering up the, the questions? Yes, we got a question from Trundane saying, given the tight target focus, what limit should be set, if any, on advertising to the mass market? Hmm. Hmm. Limits on advertising. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, if you spoke to anybody in PR, they wouldn't know exactly what that meant. Uh, so, I mean, you could have uh, limits on... Uh, advertising in terms of how much you spend, um, I think that they probably don't need to spend that much on advertising. Uh, the community is so vocal, uh, and it's spreading really quickly. And and clearly, this whatever community they have is already willing to you know forego the heat and shelter and things like that for this game. <laughs> eat ramen, so, eat ramen noodles yeah. for the next year and a half. Uh, uh, I think maybe he was asking about um, maybe about making this game more exclusive. Um, yeah. There's a game called X or the X series, uh, okay. X2, X3, all of these X games, which are really great games, but they're kind of a small community. I think yeah. this game in itself is just a juggernaut. Um, look at the money that it's raising. It, it's obviously there's a very adamant community that are gonna 
they're gonna love this game no matter what. So I think they're gonna help promote it. Um, I don't even know if they would bother mass market marketing. I mean, like putting it out yeah. on commercials and stuff. I did they even need to? I I don't think they do. I mean, you know, I feel like that's part of it is you know keeping the community tight and making sure that it sort of stays player driven. That will definitely help out the game in the long run. So I bet they won't do too much mass marketing. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking about, there's an article I saw about uh, feature creep in Star Citizen, oh, yeah. uh, and uh, basically the article is saying that, you know, there's really, there's no such thing as feature creep in MMOs. No. Uh, and I agree, I agree to a point, um, but I think that in order to make sure that they prioritize, prioritize features that, I guess, their primary player base wants, then they should really, um, I mean, it's best if the community kind of stays or at least the vocal part of the community stays within that kind of group of really hardcore people mm -hmm. uh, who who think about this stuff a lot, and you know they uh, that way they can keep the feature set at least at launch to be you know really tight, and yet you know um, it's filled out in like the areas that you know we're really interested in. Yeah, Bill, there was a if you, uh, if you go up higher, there was a couple more questions I think. Oh, sorry, my. Internet's gonna be a bit of trouble here. Uh, can you take that one? Yeah, I go back up. I have to scroll back up here. Oh, welcome, Pol Polonium Fist. We'll do a shout out at the end here of all of our viewers. Oh, Polonium here. Fist. Uh, let's see. Go way back up here. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> let's see. There was a question right in the very beginning. Singing my song. By the way, if you guys like the. Um, the intro song, it was made by Mr. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. I had a lot of fun. I made it like super spacey, like as spacey as I could possibly make it. Of course. No, actually, I don't see it. I thought there was a couple questions I up there. I don't think so. I think, uh, I think that was the first question. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's go on to uh, SEPA call. If this game looks good, if, if this game looks to emulate a real economy, then do you think the players will be able to create their own in-game companies and the following and following the subject of advertisement be able to advertise your in-game services of wares? Ooh. Wow. That's a good question. That would be, that would be really oh. cool. I think they're going to, from this is my opinion, I believe they're going to be allowing in-game uh, in stores and things like that, of course. Yeah. Um, and I, mean, I know they were talking about allowing different internet radio stations to be able to broadcast to the ships because uh, they're going to set it up to where when you're in an in, 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 in individual sector that you can get the communications in that sector. But if you're five sectors away from a transmission point, it takes like an hour for that information to come in if you don't travel there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So they, they're going to allow you to like have different sectors are going to be able to have different radio stations they are going to let you play on and you know uh, I used to do an internet radio show a long time ago but um, so yes I believe that they could possibly if you're having that internet radio station allowed then maybe you'd be able to advertise on that radio station like you could say hey so, buy your warp engines from uh, Billy Bob's warp engines or something <laughs> yeah they're already encouraging <laughs> yeah they're already encouraging people to uh, build ships in or do 3d modeling um, you know, build out their own ships so maybe they could sell it and, uh, you know, make a profit uh, off of it. Um, yeah. and it. As long as they could put together the production line, uh, you know, and, and get the raw materials to build out ships, they could sell the ships. Um, which I think is really, that's a, that's a fantastically cool idea. Uh, so I think that most definitely uh, you'll be able to advertise, you know, your, your shop or your wares or whatever. Um, and I guess they'll probably definitely integrate it with that uh, internet radio stations and, and things like that uh, because uh, it'll be really fascinating to see exactly how that's implemented because uh, especially with the way communication works in fiction, they would have to uh, make it so that you could have communication in a certain sector because if they had... Um, just system-based communications, you'd have to have radio stations for every single system. Right, right. I, I think that might be a bit much, especially if they're player-run. Right. It, is, it does take a lot of work to run one of those, by the way. Um, all right, so next question is from Zeltesh, which we're going to skip. 
Zelda's I don't understand what the hell you're doing over there. Um, <laughs> Having his own little party. Yeah. Freaking out. He's freaking out. He's like going all whatever. Okay. Uh, follow up. If you this is from Sepakal again. If you host a radio station and there is no system in place for advertising in game, would you be willing to take credits to advertise my company? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'll sell out. No problem. There is no problem with that. Um, <laughs> if you, yeah, and that might be a thing too. It's like a whole kind of a different economy can be built up just from just from advertising and marketing within the game itself. You know. I think it's uh, very possible to see that coming in the future, uh, especially if they're going to allow um, different different radio stations and, and different ways to advertise. Sure, why not? I mean, I would love it to where you'd be able to put a sticker or a decal on your ship, and if you did it right, you could say, look, I'll advertise your warp engine company, if, you know, put it on the side of my ship like you do with your car, and you pay me uh, 500 credits a day or something like that, whatever it is, you know. Mm-hmm. be something like that. Yeah. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think it'd be pretty awesome. I mean, uh, I, I I'm I have no hesitation when it comes to selling out. I'm <laughs> willing to pour myself to whatever degree, <laughs> no problem. Exactly. Uh, let's see here. Um, new question from W J Bullock. What is your biggest concern about the game, and what do you think could go wrong? A, that's a that's a deep question right there. Uh, that's deep. Okay. I think it's... Uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, Bill. So, I would say that my biggest worry is... So, we've seen a lot of trouble with MMOs that don't have a subscription base, right? I, I, I often find that you kind of need that $15 a month to really keep the universe going. Mm-hmm. And now because, you know, maybe it'll work out, maybe it won't, I'm not sure... But also, I mean, you know, 10 years down the road, this is going to be an old game. So, you know, there'll there'll have to be constant graphics updates and, you know, game, like, engine updates, which I think they will definitely do. I think Chris Roberts is pretty dedicated to that, but we'll just have to see if it works out. What what is the funding model? Have they locked one down yet? Uh, They're going to be doing... It's free to play with microtransactions. uh, in the store, and then player-generated content. And I think that's really what's going to keep the game going. It's emergent gameplay. And that's why EVE is still around. I mean, EVE, it's an ugly-ass game, if you look at it. I mean... You're trying uh, to fly a ship with a with an Excel spreadsheet. Right, exactly. Right. It's just... It's, uh, it, for newcomers, it's it's like a brick wall in terms of its <laughs> learning curve. Yeah. It's... So, Yeah. basically, this... I mean, the game is going to be... It's, it's definitely probably... It's definitely going to be more accepting to new players compared to EVE. Uh, but it's still going to have that that really, uh, uh, I guess, grab you by the throat aspect of emergent gameplay. You know that'll keep people playing because it's not just that they have fun memories of like raiding with their friends or something like that. But it's it's they no. shaped the universe. You know no, they had that a your fees paid for your hangar. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. It's like it it draws you in in a way that uh, I think a lot of like theme park MMOs like. World of Warcraft or you know Guild Wars things like that they don't do uh, yeah. they don't grab you like uh, like uh, like Star Citizen or Eve would. So mm-hmm. what is your big? That was Bill's biggest or Pancake sorry biggest worries. What's yours? Um, it's got to be uh, Black Mesa syndrome. Uh, What's and that? So Black Mesa Source is uh, it's a game. It's not a game. It's a mod for Half Life Two. Yeah. Uh, and basically, it took like fifteen billion years to make, <laughs> and everybody was expecting it to be the greatest thing on the history of in like the history of the world. You know, like this is going to be incredible. They've been working on it for so long. Uh, it's got to be awesome. And I think people forgot that Half Life One was janky as hell. Mm-hmm. So, I think it's in the, to the same degree this could suffer uh, a bit in that people might have overblown expectations for what it's going to be at launch. Um, I think that uh, they'll probably handle the servers okay. I mean, they've been doing a great job so far. Uh, like with the hangar module, there were no crashes or, or overloaded servers or anything like that. Uh, I think especially with the way that they're doing content, they're bringing out the hangar, then they're essentially just updating the hangar until uh, they shut down the game in however many years. Uh, but I think that 
uh, people should really adjust their expectations for what the game's going to be at launch. Um, it's going to be a great universe. It's going to be uh, uh, going to be a lot of stuff that you can do, uh, but you're just not going to be able to do absolutely everything. Uh, so yeah, that's what that's what I mean by Black I mean. Games. Star Citizen also has the uh, reputation of like tanking servers right away, so mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be unplayable for a few days when it launches. That's fine, everybody knows that's that's normal. My yeah. biggest worry actually is kind of a strange one. Um, I kind of want them to limit it to be mostly joystick space sim. Yeah. Uh, I, I say that because there's a game out right now called War Thunder, which some of you've seen me play, or. They even have Star. I do play. Yeah, I do play War Thunder or or Star yeah. Conflict, and specifically, I'm going to talk about War Thunder because War Thunder is a is a, is a flight sim, and you're doing old combat. Uh, turn. So you're doing good old fashioned World War II style combat, and during that fight, you would think that the person with the joystick has the upper hand, but actually, yeah. the way the game is set up is it's the person with the mouse that has the upper hand uh, because they built in these things called trainers and and if you just all you have to do is move your mouse to where you want to go and you'll fly that way now in the future I suppose that would probably be more like what you're going to do like they might have a headset and you just kind of look where you're gonna fly your spaceship in the future uh, so joysticks might be something as a thing of the past but as of right now it's kind of how you fly a plane uh, or a fighter plane specifically, and a mouse just is ridiculous because if you're in a hard bank, your mouse would fall off the table, then your your plane's gonna go into circle circ loops. Right. So uh, yeah, I'm kind of hoping that they keep it mostly a joystick. What do you guys think? Well, I mean, I have I have this. Yeah, me too. Pixel Pro. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm hoping <laughs> that I didn't spend money on that for no reason, obviously. But uh, I think for I don't I don't know. It's funny because he was Chris Robert was, was talking about how he wanted to make it so that everything is fly by wire, um, which is actually how I mean that's how modern planes work. They're fly by wire, and they don't have they don't have joysticks like this. They have uh, they're force force sensitive ones. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, when you when you turn, it doesn't it doesn't turn like this way. It doesn't go like this or this. It actually just goes. It senses the force that you're, you're pushing on it. Yeah, yeah, I saw it. Right. That's the SciTech uh, high end one, right? That's the three hundred and fifty or four hundred fifty dollar one. You just, you just wherever you touch your hand on it is how it moves. I think I'd break the damn thing because I'm always like <laughs> flying. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, I'm gonna just snap it right off, you know, because <laughs> it's not moving, and I'm like, I can go farther over. So yeah, yeah. but yes, I, I agree. What do you think, Bill? So. I will definitely be playing the game with a joystick, but I am all right that they're going to be open to people who would rather play with a controller with a mouse and keyboard. So I'm not sure. I guess I would like it if the main way to play was the joystick, but I would, I, I would say that I support that they're doing the other things as well. I, I think mouse flying is okay, but I don't want to see that being the default way to play. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, I agree. I think that would be, be kind of difficult. So I guess we can move on. we got some more questions popping up here. Um, given all of this player-owned commerce trading advertising, how much of a cut should Star Citizen get? I'm a, I'm a, I'm okay with like a sixty forty, like sixty to the person who made it and forty to the developer, something like that. Yeah, or seventy thirty. Seventy thirty. Seventy thirty is pretty typical, I think. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's yeah. probably about right. All right, uh, next question, Rotorax. Uh, what do you guys think will be the final number on pledge count? Will it ever stop? No. Oh. I don't think it'll stop until they turn it off because people are just going to keep on dumping money and maybe they won't ever turn it off. Who knows? Right. The, I could see them getting 50 to a million, 100 million probably if we if they let it go long enough. If they let it go for the next two years and you're earning like, you know, a few million dollars a month, then yeah, you know, 50 million, that's pretty easy to get to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and they have sales like they just like hey let's make a ship and, and sell it and they'll be alright we get 6 million this month you know that's that's the kind of stuff that's going on so yeah but you know we're all of course hoping that we'll turn that off when the game actually launches yes, yes. absolutely yeah because we right. don't want people being able to go and, you know damn it I just got my ship blown up I'm gonna go donate another 50 bucks to get a new ship or whatever right. yeah I'm sure they will I'm positive yeah. they'll turn it off definitely 
All right, question. RSI is the developer. Name kind of paints themselves in the corner only if developing space games. Do you think they will change their name if this game propels them into a sphere of AAA devs and ultimately achieve their goal of becoming a developer that publishes trust to work with a project, uh, much like how Blizzard or Bungie are trusted to make some of their games? Um, I think they're actually Cloud Imperium games, right? Yeah, they are Cloud Imperium games. RSI is the wing of Cloud Imperium that working specifically on Star Citizen, but it's more of a, a it's like a, a role-playing kind of situation, like, they make ships, RSI makes ships. Right, yeah. Um, no, but I, I see the point he's bringing up. That, okay, uh, go ahead. I'm, I'm not trying to answer what it's like. Um, so, yeah, but I think, um, I feel like it's enough space sim that people will still trust them to do that, I guess, is mm -hmm. the way I would put it. You know, it's, uh... <laughs> it is, yeah. it is, you know, there, there is the overall sort of universe going on, but mm -hmm. it is still really just a space sim game at heart, so... Yeah. Yeah, right. I mean, it's fine if, if, they, if they get the image that they are the guys who did Star Citizen and they don't do anything else. I mean, that's... Yeah. Uh, that's all right. It's, uh... Yeah, I don't yeah. think... I don't think they want. I don't think they really want to be somebody who publishers trust to work on. Just work on. They don't want to work with publishers. I mean, yeah. They've they've been really, uh, you know, railing against the modern publishing model for really since the beginning. Yeah. Um, I think uh, and Chris Roberts has been super outspoken about that. And Blizzard and Bungie. I mean, they're they are. I mean, they're they're juggernauts. I mean, Blizzard. Uh, Blizzard Activision actually. It's uh, since since Activision bought them out. Uh, it's they're they're a gigantic publishing house. They make um, more money per month than has already been donated in Star Citizen right, for this exactly. entire time period. So yeah, you know, people are dump paying out through the nose for for World of Warcraft to this day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. I, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I turned it. I turned it off. I, I do it every once in a while. I'll turn it back on when the winter time comes. For whatever reason, I like to play World of Warcraft in the winter because I'm sort of stuck in my house. It's cold out, and I'm like, it always reminds me of that same time period when I really enjoyed playing World of Warcraft. So I, I always kind of fall back on it. Yeah, I always, I always uh, renew my subscription for like two months, uh, a month or two, right before the last patch of a uh, of an yeah. expansion comes out. So. And I did the same thing, so I just played through all the content, played through all the rating content, uh, and then I just shut it off again. So I just had to pay like thirty bucks and experience, plus the however much the expansion cost and experience the whole thing. So that actually but. brings up real, something really quick. I, I I have a question of my own for you guys. Um, Fire away. This this game is a sandbox MMO versus a theme park MMO, and I'll real quick just overview for the people that might be watching and don't know what I'm talking about. A sandbox MMO is wide open. It might have a storyline quest that does give you some place to kind of go next, but you're able to play however you want. A theme park MMO is designed to where there's a bunch of rides and you play them. They're like your levels and then you have your instances that you play in. You get the gear from it and then you have nothing else to do until the next theme park expansion comes out. And then you have new rides. You go play them and then they, run, they, they wear out and then you so sand parks are not designed that way. In a sand park, theoretically, you could play completely how you want. If you want to get in your ship from the very first day you play and fly in one direction and never turn around and never interact with another single person, you could, technically. I don't know if they're going to have infinite space, but theoretically, that's how you could play. Or you want to be a pirate on Mondays, but on Tuesdays you help the needy, and then you on Thursdays you want to be a merchant. You, know, you could just switch it up anytime you feel like. So... That's how I, I. That's the basis of a sand park versus a theme park MMO. What, what do you think they're going to do in Star Citizen? That's what I mean. I know it's going to be sand park, but can you explain? Kind of a. It's kind of like a little bit of a mix between a a sandbox and a theme park. So, my idea of what's going to happen is that. I'm not sure there's even going to be many quests. Like, you're going to get the Squadron 42 missions, mm -hmm. and that's obviously going to be quest-based, and it's going to have, you know, some prevalence in the persistent universe. But then once that's done, you're just kind of, you know, thrown out into open space, and, you know, you start flying in this direction, and you hear that, you know, 
some colonies being raided, so you go and help defend it. Mm-hmm. And they appreciate that, and they give you 10,000 credits, and then you go and buy a new gun, right? So it's all sort of just really just kind of gets thrown together, or not, not, not thrown together, but it gets you know, updated because there hasn't been activity here, so we're going to make something interesting happen. You know, it's, it's mm-hmm. kind of a day-by-day analysis of what they think, and then they add up. Yeah, it's a really good way to put it. I think it's like a it's like a directed sandbox almost. Okay. Or you know where it's uh, you have uh, you have the whole sandbox Eve esque experience, but at the same time, uh, the developers aren't just sitting back and you know letting players run completely amok. Um, there's some regulation to the universe in the form of you know UEE and laws. So you have if you play in UEE space. Then you can you play in a very a much more directed environment. You can get uh, the elements of uh, the theme park, uh, you know, where you run around doing missions for NPCs, uh, and you can uh, sort of build a legitimate kind of business or uh, whatever in in that space. Uh, but then you also have your lawless space, where you know if you really want that cutthroat kind of PvP experience, then you can go out to lawless space and and, and try your hand there. So I think they're doing they're doing both in a lot of ways, um, yeah. and it's really unique and cool. Awesome. Okay, um, got a couple more questions, and then we'll be wrapping it up. We're coming up on our one hour, so uh, we'll wrap it up really shortly here. Uh, question from Rotorax: What do you think of the Voyager incident? Uh, what incident is it? is it with Star Citizen? Or are you talking about the space shuttle or what? <laughs> what do you do? What uh, do you guys know what he's talking about with Voyager? The uh, Voyager Direct store. Oh, oh, Voyager Direct. Okay, yes. Yeah, explain oh, about that. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead and fill everybody in what they're talking about. I know what you're talking about, but go ahead. Uh, so the Voyager Direct store is basically it's a uh, it's a store that uses the uh, UEC credits or the United Earth credits that you can you get as either part of a package uh, and later on they open up the ability to to just buy them straight up. Um, so you can buy random crap for your hangar. You can buy posters and skin mods and, and I have a nice cot. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You get a buggy and all sorts of weird fun stuff for your hangar. Um, and uh, it's entirely optional. I mean, it's just all it is is cosmetics. Um, so yeah, and when they opened it up, people had uh, a lot of people reacted kind of I mean, violently almost against it. Really? Yeah, it was. Uh, because they were thinking, you know, what, what, what is this? Uh, the game hasn't even launched yet, and, uh, you know, you're taking money for, for stuff in-game. Um, but really what it is, it's, it's they wanted to test out the, their microtransaction, uh, their capabilities for microtransactions. Um, and if you wanted to buy cool stuff for your hangar, then, you know, you could. Like, I haven't, I have UBC sitting around, I haven't actually spent any of it Me on too. the hangar. Me too, I got like 10 grand you know? or something from buying my ships, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I haven't spent any of it on my hangar, and right now I don't really have any desire to spend it on stuff. I mean, my, I might buy a buggy or something later on just for, for kicks, but... Uh, awesome. Yeah, because it's really <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spend money because I don't, I don't want to. I'd rather, you know, get another ship instead. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, people kind of freaked out a little bit, uh, and I never understood why entirely. Uh, and then Chris Roberts put out a thing saying, hey, it's optional, you don't have to buy anything, and then everybody calm down. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, next question. Have you guys advertised, mentioned this podcast on the RSI forums or Star Citizen yet? Um, all of us here belong to Star Citizen Base, and we're all on the RSI forums. The, advertising on the RSI forums is kind of tricky, because if, you're, if your post does not get seen or at least replied to by one other person it's off the front page before you can blink like there's so many posts that are going by so i don't i didn't bother actually advertising this over there i did mention it in my video i made yesterday but i uh you know i didn't actually advertise it over there um i did post my video yesterday over there and that did fairly well uh actually um what's his name replied to it uh, the guy who burned his hand with a waffle iron. Um, oh yeah, Ben Lesnick. Yeah, Ben. Ben wrote on the he he, he was like the second comment was from Ben, nice. and it was nice. Very cool. That got cool. me a lot of things there, but um, but yeah, I don't know how we can actually get involved. And I do want the whole purpose of the show is at some point we do want to bring some people who are 
in the community who are devs. Like if Ben wants to come on our show sometime and just chat with us, that would be great too. Uh, so we're going to work on that. This is this is our very first inaugural episode, so a um, little couple of bugs we're working out and things like that. But at some point down the road, I would like to get uh, some people from that community over here. Yes, definitely. Uh, I have. Uh, do we have time for one more question? Yeah, shoot, go for it. Okay, so uh, I kind of I mentioned this earlier, but uh, to uh, uh, just to you, geek, actually. Um, but I was thinking about the uh, the announcement of Steam OS mm. uh, and how that that might affect development of Star Citizen, because I was thinking that you know they're talking about how they want to uh, they want to introduce Linux uh, as uh, the primary I guess gaming platform uh, for the next generation and Star Citizen is currently only being developed as far as as far as we know for for PC, for PC Windows PC uh, so do you think that they'll incorporate you know Linux development into into it so that they can put it on Steam OS um, I'm not seeing that. See, okay, but it's a little backup, so some of the people might not know what we're talking about. Steam, of course, is the game uh, system that you can purchase games through, and there's sort of like a cloud storage for your games. So no matter, even if you wipe out your hard drive, you don't ever lose your games, and you can even keep your save games in there too, which is really nice. I've I have a huge library now, but it doesn't include some of the older games because literally, like you see some back here, I have them on, in, in boxes. But if I didn't keep the box for the game, it was gone forever. So uh, Steam is now moving into uh, into your living room. What they're trying to do is they're going to be having a, a little box. It'll probably be about the size of this um, thing with a bunch of HDMI parts, ports and stuff like that. And it's going to be called the Steam Box. And it's going to run Linux on it. And then that will hook up to your television. And you're supposed to be able to play your entire Steam library through that. But... The problem that I can see is the games have to be written for Linux. If it's not written for Linux, what it does is it uses your computer like the uh, NVIDIA Shield, which is a little handheld controller that has a screen on it that plays your games. But the problem is, is that needs to be within range of your computer to be able to play the games on. So, that, you know, your, your TV is in the other room and it can stream from your TV to the Steam box if you have a game that's not native to Linux. I don't know if they're going to take the time to develop it for Linux at the same time that they would develop it for Windows. Personally, he is a hardcore PC gamer, and, and unfortunately that means specifically Windows right now. Uh, I know that they're discussing Mac. I have seen them talk about Mac ports, but ultimately I think right now they're going to focus just on Windows, and if, if with SteamOS, I don't know if it'll ever transition over into the Linux side. It's not a direct port. It's not as easily easy as you know, going from one operating system to another, there's a lot of changes that would need to be made. Yeah. I mean, there is, there are opening it up to modding quite a bit, so yeah. I'm sure, given enough time, someone will figure it out. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I, I think it'll be great if it does. I mean, I think SteamOS is going to, to be honest, I personally think SteamOS is going to be huge, uh, especially yeah. considering that um, the graphical gains that you get uh, and the processing capability yes. that you have it's on, more like a console Linux. Yeah. yeah exactly you get it's, less yeah. overhead from DirectX and stuff exactly much more optimized so mm -hmm. I think for because so for the same amount of power you can get a lot more graphical performance um, and I think that uh, it'll open up stars that if if they if they do develop something for Linux um, then uh, it'll open up a lot more people to be able to play the game on, I guess, increased graphical settings. Because right now, they're saying they're targeting the 770, which is what I have in my PC. That's what I've got too, yep. For a medium... Medium settings. Medium graphical quality. So if I want to play it on Max, then I'm going to have to do an SLI configuration, uh, which is going to run me another 450 400. bucks. Well, maybe not in the two years until it comes out, because in two years, a 770 might only cost $150, $200, maybe. Uh, that's true, yeah. But, I mean, it's... Uh, so basically... Uh, you'd have to, you probably have to drop, uh, you know, some I'm more money on a graphics card. I'm showing uh, right now, this, this video on the screen right now is me inside my Freelancer, with, and it's running on a 770, so you can see how smooth it's running right now compared to in the future, I, they must, they're just going to have to crank up the graphics, I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah it'll be a lot. Like pre-alpha, too. So. Yeah, it's still pre-alpha. Yeah. The screen will be a lot busier, because imagine you have your Freelancer, right. which is, you right. know, or even like a Bengal carrier with you know millions and millions of polys, 
uh, and it's sitting in space, and it's, you know, in a fight with, like, 30 other ships, which are all made of tens of thousands of other polys, and you have, you know, flares and things, so, I mean, it's going to be a busy, it's going to be a busy, busy game. Uh, well, let me show some of that, some dogfighting, then, because this is some dogfighting from, this is pre-pre-alpha, I don't even know what you call something before alpha, but this is... Yeah, uh, Prototype. Prototype. Yeah, prototype. this is just uh, the the lasers you're seeing here are just for reference. They, they are not going to have these different multicolored lasers apparently in the game, so mm -hmm. you won't see as much pew pew like this. But um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's good. I think that's a that's a great first edition of our Star Citizen Starcast. Yes, awesome. Yay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Perfect and Pancakes, for coming here tonight and chatting with us. And I appreciate all the help. No problem. It was a blast. Yep. It was fun. You guys did a great job. Uh, okay, so a little bit of housework. Uh, this video will be available on my channel within like a couple of hours. The audio only version uh, will be available probably tomorrow. I have to rip it down and then I also uh, clean it up a little bit so it sounds good on your iPod. So usually the next day is when the, the audio only version, but I'll put a link in the video description. Uh, Perfect and Pancakes are more than welcome to put this video on their channel too. So uh, you might be able to find it on either one of their channels. Uh, Perfect, what, you have a YouTube channel. Uh, I do, it's currently in its nascent state. It's, okay. uh, it's just uh, Perfect underscore nerd. Okay, perfect. Underscore the same way you have it actually, spelled here. Actually, actually, no, it's not. Sorry, There's, that's a, that's a different channel. Uh, <laughs> so it's actually perfect underscore sc for Star Citizen content okay. only. Perfect. Um, I'll put that in the chat. Perfect. And uh, you can always. Uh, I'm on Twitter now. Uh, my I guess my branding for Twitter is perfect nerd, uh, which is all one word. Okay, cool. How about you, pancakes? I, I don't have a YouTube channel. Oh, YouTube it's, channel? It's, it's non-existent. Okay, fair enough. I'll, I'll direct all my views to you. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. All right, guys. Well, like, like I said, thanks again, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, it was great having you tonight, and I will see you all very, very soon. Until next time, see ya. See ya. Bye.